Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the Tool Bench. You know, my dad built his own house when he was only 19 years old, and that was long before you could run out to the local mega home center to pick up a good power tool. I gained a real respect for hand tools for my dad, but I don't think I'd ever want to give up my power tools. I've gotten so used to them, it's hard to imagine a time when they weren't around. But in the long history of tools, power, well, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Beginning with primitive tools made from rocks, human civilization could be measured by how we make, use, and improve tools. From stone to copper and later iron and steel, we've been making tools for at least two and a half million years. At the very end of this spectrum, about 0.0004% of the tool timeline, are power tools. The ability to motorize and electrify tools made it possible to build houses, skyscrapers, and entire communities with unprecedented speed and efficiency. They've also made using tools just a little more exciting. I think the mystique is all about power and speed. And I don't know that males are more interested in power and speed than females, but I think everybody is interested in getting a job done more quickly and more efficiently. Today, the power tool industry is booming thanks to the steady introduction of tools that are lighter, cordless, and more powerful than ever, which for many is the best part of all. There's the guy I know that doesn't say more horsepower would be better, bigger, better lawnmower. And most of the guys I know will modify just about anything. Lawnmower, you know, if you take that, if you take the Venturi out of that carburetor, you can get a little bit more horsepower. Is there any reason to get more horsepower out of a lawn boy? I don't think so. But always more horsepower is better. Powered by stronger batteries and more efficient motors, today's portable cordless power tools can perform just as effectively as their cord-bound predecessors. And batteries are not the only energy source. Some tools are powered by compressed air. The Stanley Bostitch Company is most commonly associated with desktop staplers. But at their East Greenwich, Rhode Island plant, they produce some of the best-selling pneumatic nail and staple guns on the market today. This roofing stapler, powered by a 90 pounds per square inch burst of compressed air, can drive a row of staples in seconds. And it's designed to never jam, no matter how inept the user. A different type of nail gun is manufactured at the Porter Cable Plant in Jackson, Tennessee. The bammer is powered not by compressed air, but by compressed liquefied gas, also known as a fuel cell. The advantage of this energy source is that it doesn't have to be connected to an air compressor to work. Meanwhile, at the Ryobi plant in Pickens, South Carolina, a reciprocating saw that could tear through walls runs off liquid gasoline, just like a lawnmower. But for the vast majority of power tool users, the preferred energy source is still the battery. Thanks to the power of today's batteries, circular saws can cut through wood like a knife through butter. Drill bits can be powered to bore holes just as fast as you can pull the trigger. But behind the story of circular saws and drill bits are two now forgotten names. They made their marks in the tool industry before we even had electricity. One was a woman, the other a blacksmith with a fondness for whiskey, and their influence is still felt today. In the 1800s, the Shakers, a religious community that had flourished in the eastern United States, were well known for their exceptional furniture and woodworking skills. But it was a Shaker sister named Tabitha Babbitt who in 1810 got a great idea. It came to her while working at her spinning wheel. She uh, worked around a lot of uh, men who uh, toiled day in and day out uh, sawing logs uh, the way that they did it for centuries, which was basically they would take a log and position it over a pit 
and one man was in the pit and one man was above and they took a large handsaw and simply sawed through the log and of course she saw that that was incredibly labor intensive and very uh, very hard work and so she came up with the idea of let's take that straight blade put it on a wheel it occurred to Babbitt that a circular revolving blade could cut wood more efficiently than hand saws. Her idea was adopted by Shaker woodworkers who powered the circular saws by hand cranks and later by water wheels. So think of Tabitha the next time you pick up that circular saw blade, the one you probably assumed was invented by a man. The next time you change a drill bit, you might think of this Ohio blacksmith. In 1884, William Mack Dimmitt took out a patent on a drill bit that he forged out of steel. Prior to Dimmitt, drill bits were either similar to straight, tapered files, or they had a screw-like twist. What made Dimmitt's unique was that it had a solid stem running through the middle of a screw-like twist. Dimmitt probably didn't realize that he created one of the best bits ever made. But today, you'll never find William Dimmitt's name in a hardware store, but you will find his drill bit. Here's my favorite drill bit. This is an Irwin Auger, which sounds like a cartoon character name, but it's not. It's a guy named Charles Irwin who was a pharmacist in Ohio. Now, how does a pharmacist get a drill bit? Well, this is back in the 1880s when drugstores actually sold alcoholic beverages. One of his customers was William Dimmitt, who uh, loved to come in every day and consume some of these alcoholic beverages, ran up a bill and then couldn't pay it. He had invented this. William Demet had invented this drill bit. So he traded the patent on this to Charles Irwin for uh, his back bill of alcohol. William Demet sold his patent to Charles Irwin for the dismissal of his $20 back bill and a bottle of whiskey. Irwin immediately formed a company to manufacture the drill bit. Still manufactured today, about 100 million Irwin Auger drill bits have been sold since the day William Dimmitt traded his patent for a whiskey debt. The contributions of Tabitha Babbitt and William Dimmitt aside, it wasn't until 1895 that the world would see the first portable electric power tool. It came a full 16 years after Thomas Edison harnessed electricity to power the incandescent electric lamp. The tool was a drill invented by the German engineering firm of C&E Fine. It weighed 16 and a half pounds and was powered not only by its DC motor, but by the weight of the user. It would take about another 20 years before two men would significantly improve the electric drill and become household names as a result. The year was 1910. A tool and die worker named Duncan Black sold his car for $600. He used the money to open a machine shop in Baltimore with his friend, Alonzo Decker. Thoughts of designing a new type of drill had intrigued them, but they weren't sure how to do it. Then, in 1914, an idea seemed to consume them both at the same moment. They were both in my father's kitchen one Saturday, and they were sitting around a table trying to bright, get a bright idea of how they could do this. And father had a Colt automatic laying on the kitchen table. And as they were looking at the sky or the stars or whatever, they, each one of them happened to look at that Colt automatic. And so my mother tells me that the two of them said, that's it at the same time. The epiphany Black and Decker had was to adapt the design of the Colt 45 to the electric drill. In 1916, they began marketing the first pistol grip trigger switch drills. And this was one of the first Black and Decker drills housed at the company headquarters in Townsend, Maryland. Black and Decker's design resulted in a lighter drill that could be handled by one man. The motor was smaller and more powerful than those used on the German drills. Suddenly, the power tool industry was off and running, and right on the heels of Black & Decker would come other familiar names. 
Today, almost everyone has used a power drill. But one of the oldest power tools might be the least familiar to the novice do-it-yourselfer. This is a router. These small, round tools are used to spin a variety of bits to cut grooves into wood pieces like doors or cabinets. The router was invented three years after Black & Decker's pistol grip drill. The year was 1919, and the inventor was a pattern maker named R.L. Carter. This now made it possible for people to put molded profiles on the edges of work pieces, whereas before they had to have very expensive, very elaborate hand planes, which were difficult to sharpen, uh, difficult to operate, and now you had one electric tool that could do it and almost anybody could operate it. Carter came up with the idea for the router while reworking an electric barber's clipper in his garage. In the years to follow, there would be a steady stream of power tool innovations. Herbert Tots entered the field in 1923 from his Milwaukee, Wisconsin garage. There he invented the earliest version of this tool, the scroll saw. The scroll saw has a cutting blade that reciprocates in an up and down fashion. Tots called his model the American boy scroll saw. The user cranked a handle to put the saw in motion. But Tots also sold a scroll saw with a 1 20th horsepower motor in place of the crank. The manual saw sold for $6 and was popular with hobbyists, while the motorized version was sold to professionals for four times as much. Tots's company no longer operates out of a garage. Today, it's the Delta Corporation, a leader in the industry. In 1918, automobile maker Henry Ford challenged a young tool manufacturer, A.H. Peterson, to produce a smaller, lighter electric drill for long days on the assembly line. Peterson delighted Ford with a five-pound electric drill, capable of handling the heavy demands of the car industry. It was also the first drill that could be operated with only one hand. Peterson called it the hole shooter. In 1924, facing financial difficulties caused by a fire at his plant, Peterson sold the hole shooter to A.F. Siebert, who used the drill to begin the Milwaukee Tool Company. A pioneer in the power saw industry got its start in the 20s as well. That's when an inventor from Louisiana, Edmund Michel, stood in the sugarcane field and was appalled by what he witnessed. Cutting sugarcane was a brutally difficult job. Field hands withering in the hot sun would swing machetes over and over again to cut the thick cane. Michel set out to ease the grueling work by attempting to motorize a machete. But, like Tabitha Babbitt, he eventually concluded that a round blade would work even better. Using the motor from a malted milk mixer to power the blade, his handheld circular saw barely cut through a cigar box. But Michel would improve upon his invention. In 1924, he began selling his 10-pound skill saw for an astronomical $160. In today's economy, that would be more than $1,500. And even at that price, it had serious limitations. In 1926, a young inventor was inspired by Edmund Michel's success with the skill saw. At the time, Art Emmons was working for the Porter Cable Company in Syracuse, New York. Named after the company's two founders, Porter Cable started in 1906 making pencil sharpeners. And of course, like other early tool manufacturers, they made them out of a garage. But by the 20s, Art Emmons believed the promise of power tools was great. Emmons envisioned a way to solve the labor-intensive jobs of sanding and finishing. Up until that time, all sanding had to take place on large stationary machines. So he felt that if you could design a product that instead of either sanding by hand or having to pick something large up and carry it to a machine to be sanded, it would greatly improve productivity. In 1926, Emmons invented the first portable belt sander. Weighing less than 15 pounds, it enabled workers to carry the tool to the work instead of vice versa. 
Because of this, Emmons called it the takeabout. It would garner the young inventor the first of more than 50 patents for tools and parts. Emmons' takeabout would be Porter Cable's best-selling tool for decades to come. He designed it with features that would take competitors years to equal. He installed a dust collection system and positioned the motor in such a way that the takeabout could even sand flush up against baseboards. Thanks to the innovations of the 1920s, the power tool industry was growing, even in a world where whole communities were still without electricity. But just as this new industry was gaining momentum, turmoil was about to strike, and it would strike hard. Now this is my idea of a power tool. Today you can buy a tool like this from stores, catalogs, or internet services. And you can just as easily get any advice you need on how to use it. This being the information age, information is everywhere. But imagine being one of the first power tool salesmen at a time when a lot of people didn't even have electricity. And your tool cost a month's salary. Pretty tough sell. When a power tool company offers a new product today, they can show it off to millions of people at once. All it takes is one TV commercial. But it wasn't always this easy. During the 1920s and 30s, when the power tool industry was in its infancy, there was no television nor gigantic home centers with employees trained to use the tool. So how did these fledgling power tool companies sell their product? They had salespeople who used to put these tools in the trunk of their car and they'd drive around the streets of their community looking for job sites or where contractors or professionals were being used and they would go in and they would go ahead and show the features and the benefits of this product and convince the owner that he had to part with often months wages, maybe even two months wages to buy one of these newfangled electric tools, but he could always sell the productivity. As if it wasn't enough to convince someone to give up a month's salary for a tool, these determined salesmen had an even bigger obstacle in their way. Many of the markets they went to didn't even have electricity, so a lot of the salesmen, it said, would carry portable generators that were gas-driven so they could fire up the generator to show the particular individual or prospective buyer what this tool would do once they got electricity. So you can imagine what a hard sell that was. When it needed it the most, the industry would receive an important boost in the form of instant mass marketing and credibility. In 1928, Sears Roebuck began offering power tools in their popular mail order catalog. It was a time when many Americans still lived in far-flung farming communities and did not have many choices or opportunities for buying new products. But when the catalog arrived, it was an exciting chance to see how the world was changing from a swing on their own front porch. They would arrive and they would spend days, weeks, social hours turning the pages of that catalog looking at these new innovative products. And here you are in an agricultural community or in a farming community and you see a drill or anything that could make your job easier. Once electricity got there, it was like the things dreams are made of. You'd sit there and you'd think about it at night. Because remember, there was no Monday night football. But in the blink of an eye, the power tool industry's fortunes, along with everyone else's, would take a change for the worse. On October 29th, 1929, the bottom fell out of the stock market, and neither Alonzo Decker's pistol grip drill nor Art Emmons' take about Sander could do anything to fix this mess. With the Depression, jobs dried up, and professionals could no longer afford expensive tools because they had no place to use them. The story at Black & Decker was the same as it was at other power tool companies. It was about layoffs. And the first to go was a recent college graduate, the son of the founding partner, Al Decker Jr. My father called me in and said, son, we're gonna have to lay off an awful lot of people because business is really going to hell in a handbasket. And I said, and I'm not gonna lay off anybody else as long as you're here, so you're gonna have to be number one. I said, I understand, father. Okay. In 1932, the newly elected president, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was promising a new deal. Keep that faith high. So shall we win through 
to a better day. And even though the country was still mired in financial turmoil, a sense of optimism arose. And most importantly to builders, the power tool industry offered a product that was essential to the promise of future growth. Months after FDR's election, Sears offered their first catalog dedicated to power tools. Craftsman would become a brand name for a variety of power tools made by different tool makers to meet the marketer's requirements. Even though power tools were still predominantly bought by professionals, they were sneaking their way into the consumer market. In 1932, A.J. Dremel, a Racine, Wisconsin engineer and inventor, launched a company from, you guessed it, his garage to produce and sell his small motor tool for hobbyists. Marketed as a hundred tools in one, it would grind, route, and polish. It's still made in Racine by the Dremel Company and today performs all those jobs and many others. Companies like Milwaukee, Black & Decker, Porter Cable, and Sears had no sooner emerged from the Depression when they were plunged into World War II. The experience at Porter Cable was typical. Still yearning to reach a mass market, their primary mission now was meeting the demands of the U.S. military. Porter Cable got into the effort by supplying what was known as the G8 belt sander. And this was a large floor standing machine that was used in the manufacturing tank and heavy armament as well as the aircraft industry. We were also called into service to make things that we had no knowledge or practicality of, such as valves for torpedoes, aircraft parts, as well as parachute ripcord. Meanwhile, at Black & Decker, Al Jr. was brought back to the company and was rising quickly through the executive ranks. He was offered a commission in the Army, but the government declared his work at Black & Decker essential to the war effort. So Decker stayed and fought the war from the factory floor, where the demand for electric drills was higher than ever before. And building airplanes, all the holes were all drilled with electric drills. So we began getting orders for electric drills that were just out of this world. During the war, Decker received some information that he would tuck away for an important innovation once the war was over. When the whistle blew, airplane factory employees frequently took their Black & Decker drills home with them. They weren't stealing. It's just that during the war, the government implored people with a new national logo. Fix it yourself. Plumbers, electricians, and repairmen were away in the service or in defense jobs. Department stores and community centers organized special workshops to teach people how to do it themselves. After World War II, all this influx of soldiers returning from the war, buying these little houses, they're still working, they don't really have all that much money, and that's how the do-it-yourself movement sort of got started. These guys were buying these houses, building these houses, and they were fixing them up themselves. After the war, Decker already knew, based on his experience with the airline workers taking drills home, that there was a market for consumer-oriented power tools. In 1946, Black & Decker introduced just such a line. They were crafted from lighter weight metals, were smaller, easier to grasp, and had lower amperage than the tools that had built the war machine. They didn't have to be of the same quality, because instead of drilling hundreds of holes daily for airplanes, these were used for weekend household chores. The compromise in size and power also made the tools affordable for consumers. Within three years, the company sold over one million quarter-inch drills. It was much more successful than we ever dreamed that it was going to be. And we followed up with a very expanded line of products for all of those people who do it themselves. And it's been an excellent market, and still is. 1946 would also see the introduction of another popular power tool. A Swiss employee of what is now the Skill Bosch Corporation invented this tool, a handheld version of the scroll saw, the jigsaw. 
but it didn't look like this at the time. Albert Kaufman was attempting to repair his wife's sewing machine. While working on the machine, my guess is he was in the garage, Kaufman had an idea. He would replace the up and down reciprocating stitch rig with a blade. The result was a portable saw capable of making intricate cuts in wood. Yet, of all the developments that came out of the post-war years, the most significant was a new material that would revolutionize power tools. It would not only make them lighter and less expensive, it would help prevent millions from having a shocking experience. Electricity and I, I have, a, have a thing. I've gotten shocked more than I care to admit because I've tried to do things the wrong way. If you're gonna work on electrical things, stay out of water and shut the circuit breaker off. Even if you heeded Tim Allen's advice, prior to the 1960s, a power tool might have given you a nasty shock anyway. Back then, the only protection between the user and an electrical shock was the grounding wire that ran through the third prong of a power cord. Plastic would become the key to making power tools not only safer, but lighter and more durable. However, when plastic first replaced metal on power tools in the 1960s, it left many suspicious. People associated plastic with the terrible stench that arose when a toy fell behind a radiator and melted. That was the image that plastic had in that time frame. We weren't using those kinds of plastics, and uh, our pitch uh, to uh, our, our, our customers was that uh, if you ride in an airplane, quite probably the windows are made out of the same material as our drills are made out of. The plastic used on both airplane windows and power tool housings is a polycarbonate resin, which is much stronger than the softer plastic used on toys. Plastic manufacturers proved the strength of this material in a convincing way. They fired a 357 Magnum at it. The bullet couldn't penetrate the plastic. But an even more important reason for using plastic was that it made power tools a lot safer. In the 1960s, new methods of machining plastic resins made it possible to double insulate tools. Now, besides the grounding wire, another layer of protection would be added to the motor. Right at the heart of our motors is the rotor, or what we call the armature, which is the uh, moving part of the electric motor. A single insulated power tool would have pressed this lamination directly on the shaft, steel to steel. The problem with steel to steel contact is that if a short occurred inside the motor, it would shock the user. In a double insulated motor, the steel parts are separated by this white protective plastic resin. In its raw form, the resin looks like putty. It can even be rolled and molded like putty. Here, it's placed into a pressure heating machine. It will actually be baked onto motors, which in this case are for Craftsman circular saws. This all takes place at the Ryobi Power Tool Plant in Pickens, South Carolina. But similar procedures are used by most power tool manufacturers today. And even as these double insulated saws wind their way through the rest of the assembly process, they won't reach consumers until they're proven safe. Each tool is individually tested before going into its box. Samples of each different tool manufactured at Ryobi are pulled off the assembly line for even further testing. What happens to this sander is typical. This is called the six-foot drop test. Now the point of this test isn't to make sure the tool doesn't break when it's dropped. More importantly, it's to make sure that no damage has occurred in the motor that might lead to an electrical malfunction. That's the force, 1170 pounds, that that sander hit with. 
After the test, the tool is run on diagnostic equipment to assure its safety. Other problems could be detected by the sound the tool makes. Once the tester sets up a microphone, the sander is ready for a solo. Any unusual changes in the tone and pitch of the tool would indicate an operational problem that would have to be further investigated. You can't enter this room without heavy ear protection. A dozen or more power tools run continuously, sometimes for weeks at a time. The goal was to figure out how long each tool can run before having any motor problems. Ah, that's better. While plastic and such extensive testing made power tools better and safer, another great advance made them easier to use. It occurred when power tools shed their cords. Beginning in World War II, battery technology was advancing. Some of the very first rechargeable batteries were used to trigger torpedoes from submarines and battleships. I had been reading about these for quite some time, and the improvement in the batteries was so substantial. I kept wondering if we couldn't possibly make such an improvement in a power drill that could make use of batteries. In 1961, while many companies were exploring the possibility of introducing battery-operated power tools, Black & Decker is credited with bringing the first cordless tool, a drill, to market. It was powered by rechargeable nickel-cadmium batteries developed during World War II. The cordless drill sparked a revolution in the industry. It freed the user from being tied to a wall socket, but also had some disadvantages. The 4.8-volt batteries were not powerful enough for heavy-duty work and required overnight charging. It wouldn't be until the 1980s that these problems were solved. But first, in 1971, cordless technology, limited as it might be, would play a key role in space exploration. Astronauts Dave Scott and Jim Irwin took a cordless drill to the moon as part of their Apollo 15 mission. There, they would experience both the joys and the frustrations of early cordless tools. Using the drill to probe the lunar surface, they would conduct an extensive geological survey. While the drill's bits and battery pack were made by NASA, the power head was made by Black & Decker. The power head consists of the motor and the chuck, which is the device that grips the drill bit. Scott used the drill to acquire rock samples and to sink a heat measuring probe deep into the lunar surface. But the drill, only about half as powerful as most of today's consumer drills, strained to bore through the soil and rock. In fact, Dave Scott would have bruised fingernails for several weeks after the mission because of the pressure he had to exert. Okay, Dave, take heart. You've got just one minute of drilling left. In spite of the strain, the drill succeeded in helping to retrieve samples from eight feet beneath the lunar surface. Five years later, America would celebrate its bicentennial. This year-long birthday party not only honored America, it sparked another great era of do-it-yourself. Among other things, the celebration would inspire Americans to refurbish historical sites. The effort would revitalize the do-it-yourself movement that was so prevalent in the years after World War II. It's time to talk some of my favorite work, which is the sidewall. Perhaps it's nobody received more attention for their efforts than a Cuban-born architect named Bob Vila. The bicentennial in this country really got folks excited about polishing the brass doorknob, about cleaning the windows, about looking at their hundred-year-old house and saying, this is a valuable piece of history. I gotta, you know, I gotta fix it up. Okay, Vila was again. involved in restoring a Victorian home that was so impressive, it garnered national media coverage. Vila's uncanny ability to explain his art and technique in an interesting and informative way landed him his first television series 
this old house in 1978. With the realities of the economy in the 70s and in the 80s, uh, where a lot of people simply didn't have the money to hire craftsmen and artisans to come and do the paint job or do you know certain repair work for them that they had to do it themselves and when we came along with the home improvement shows we were kind of empowering them over the next 20 years Vila would go on to host other do-it-yourself series including home again and become the standard for at least a half dozen similar series to follow by the early 1980s, Vila's wide audience of do-it-yourselfers were in the market for newer, better power tools. In response, several power tool manufacturers introduced new batteries that were not only more powerful, but were interchangeable between tools like drills, sanders, and jigsaws. Now, the industry was producing easier to use, safer, and more versatile cordless tools than ever before. Yet, the thirst for more power was about to push power tools to yet another plateau. Well, let's face it, we can come up with all sorts of good reasons for using power tools. We save money by doing home improvement jobs ourselves. We can work more quickly and more efficiently. We can uh, build little birdhouses for our feathered friends. But you know what? The truth is, most people just think more power is really cool. On almost any given weekend, cities across the country play host to do-it-yourself fairs, like this one outside Cleveland, Ohio. Here, do-it-yourself gurus come to inspire the crowds. It's also a chance for toolmakers to show off the powerful capabilities of their newest tools. Fantastic machine. Remember Albert Kaufman, who converted his wife's sewing machine to a jigsaw for the Bosch company? Well, today, the company is known as Skill Bosch, and it's still making jigsaws. But now, jigsaws can take a power plunge like this and still make an intricate cut. Remember Art Emmons, who invented the takeabout sander in 1926? Well, it's no longer called the takeabout, but Porter Cable's newest belt sander still has Art Emmons' creative fingerprints all over it, including the basics of the design and the dust collector. Remember A.H. Peterson, who invented the hole shooter for Henry Ford? Well, now the company that emerged, Milwaukee Tools, is best known for the Sawzall. You should take the Sawzall, you push it against the material you're cutting with the light pressure on the top. You should never have to overload the tool at all. Let the tool do the work. Contractors have loved this tool since it was first introduced in the 1950s because it cuts through darn near anything at all sorts of angles. Meanwhile, the innovator of the pistol grip drill, Black & Decker, offers a cordless power tool line with batteries that exceed 14 volts. Throughout most of the 90s, this much power was reserved for the professionals. Now, it's marketed to consumers. Instead of the traditional nickel-cadmium batteries, these tools are powered by nickel-metal hydride, a chemical compound used for cell phones and laptop computers. For years, that chemical compound did not fit well with power tools because although it yielded great runtime, it didn't do a great job from a power standpoint. But what we did is we worked with our battery supplier, in this case Panasonic, and uh, have developed kind of a breakthrough for power tools. The development of batteries that offer the longevity of a cell phone with the power to spin this 24-volt circular saw seems an appropriate way to end a hundred years of power tool history. But not quite, because a new name, one associated with not only tools, but laughter, has joined the fraternity of power tool manufacturers. It's a cutthroat business, this tool business. You know, I, I think they all get along, but I guess it's just like the other, you know, Stanley and Black & Decker and all the companies. They're very competitive. And now all of a sudden we're a player. Tim Allen is still an actor, as evidenced by the action hero makeup he's wearing on this film set. However, he isn't acting anymore when it comes to tools. In 1999, Allen launched his own line of power tools. They include a jigsaw, sander, and cordless drill. 
His inspiration for launching the line? Salad dressing. Alan is using his passion for tools to raise money for charity, just as actor Paul Newman has done with his food products. You look up to this guy because he's done so much in his career that I would certainly aspire to. And I was curious one day about how, why he got into that. It was the same, I had the same sensibilities, that it's a great way to employ even more people, get people active in, in charity work. Alan learned about motors and bearings by refurbishing abandoned washing machines as a teenager. He also used his own background in design to give the tools a personal touch. I didn't want to just sign my name on something. I wanted to have some input in how the thing was designed, because I love design, I love the whole art of design, I love the science of design, I some of my favorite heroes are designers, so I wanted to be able to get involved in that process. Alan worked with a design team from the Ryobi Corporation, the tool maker that manufactures the line. His power tools reflect many of the changes the industry has made in the last decade, to make power tools more user-friendly than ever before. A slot holds extra drill bits. The grip is ergonomically designed, meaning it's made to feel comfortable and balanced in the user's hand. And a bubble level helps identify a perfect 90-degree angle. Such concerns for convenience would probably seem a bit arcane to the men who invented the first electric drill a hundred years earlier, or to Alonzo Decker and Duncan Black, who designed the pistol grip drill a short time later. But they also carry on the spirit of these early innovators, whose goals included making our lives a bit easier and much more productive. You know, I'm really struck by how good-looking power tools are today. I could use this to drill a hole, or I could put it on my fireplace as a work of art. But to the old-timers, a power tool was for nothing but work. About 50 years ago, a friend of Porter Cable engineer Art Emmons took his dull metal takeabout sander, like this one, had it polished to a beautiful shine, and presented it to Art as a gift. Emmons took one look at it, shook his head and said, You ruined it! <laughs> For Modern Marvels, I'm Ron Hazelton.